let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, truly, Lord, you have blessed us beyond measure. We thank you for the life of Faye that she lived in front of us, how she was such a servant, Lord, that she cooked dozens and dozens of meals for churches and for the youth, and Lord, how she also was a very good cook, and people knew that, and if you didn't get in front of the line, you never got any of her food, and we just praise you for Ira, who's been so faithful to work on her 24-7 for several months now, and we just thank you for the example they set, they cleaned our church, did so many wonderful things, and we just thank them, thank you Lord for them in our life, and we ask Lord that you just bless each and every one here with the reading of your word and all the things that are coming on. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Today we're in Luke, the 19th chapter. We started at the 28th verse. Into our city. Just as Jesus rode into Jerusalem some 2,000 years ago, He's riding into our cities even as we speak. Not on the donkey, but on our backs. What kind of reception is Jesus getting today? Not a good one. And is He weeping because we do not want Him in our lives? <laughs> we will not have to have the rocks cry out for us. Can we imagine the heartache Jesus must have felt as He rode into Jerusalem? He had come to take away not only their sins, but the sins of the world. He came to defeat death, to give them new life, abundant and free, even though many would not understand and would reject Him, He was going to die that you and I might live. Looking at the end of time and with joy and gladness, He saw those who would not reject Him. And he saw how we'd be rejoicing with him in heaven. As Jesus approached the city, even though he saw the beautiful glistening temples, steeples, he saw also the emptiness of their hearts and lives. And Jesus wept. Many would not understand his coming, and they would not receive that full and abundant life he was bringing. Nor would they have eternal life with Jesus in heaven. Just as Jesus rode into Jerusalem, again, from on his wheel, the method of transportation into the cities of this world, he wants to ride into our cities and into our lives. If we could only understand the blessings that Jesus can bring into our lives, peace, joy, comfort, guidance, love, mercy, forgiveness, eternal life, constant companionship, Never leave us nor forsake us. He is our rock, our refuge in the storms of life. Not to leave anything out, He is our all in all. This life that God wants to give us is different than the one we build on earthly treasures. This life He wants to give us lasts forever. This joy and peace that God gives can last a lifetime. The world cannot give that to us. The Bible points out how to obtain these gifts by hearing and obeying. It all begins at the foot of the cross where we recognize that Jesus died for us. <laughs> then we must realize that we have need of a Savior. In Luke we find Jesus' entrance was as Zechariah predicted over 400 years earlier. And it's going to be exactly like Zechariah said. The multitude emotionally praised God, not from their hearts, and it's not going to last. <clears throat> We're going to find that sooner or later they're going to be saying, crucify him. The two groups that got all emotional and jumped up. The temple glistened with God's glory, not their hearts. Jesus wept. Jesus taught the word. He eliminated other practices in the church. He wanted them to know that the Word was the most important thing of all. Knowing the agony and pain, Jesus begins His journey to the cross. 
We're going to find this exactly as Zechariah predicted some 400 years earlier. The disciples had warned him of the danger, but they really didn't know the terrible pain and agony and abuse and desertion he was suffering. And we find that he's going to ride in on a coat instead of a stallion. And we find in the 28th verse, And when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethphage, and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent his two disciples, saying, Go ye to the beauties over against you, into which as you're entering you shall find a colt tied. Whereupon did never man said, Loose him and bring him hither. Sometimes we call things to do that we don't want to do and that we don't understand. But we must always follow God's word. Now these instructions surely seem strange to the disciples because Jesus had walked everywhere. Why not get a mighty horse? He could get a mighty horse as well as a little colt to ride in style. But Jesus has told us elsewhere that Jesus said, I am come to fulfill the scriptures. In other words, even Jesus would always follow the scriptures as we should. In his life, he always followed the scriptures and the word of God. It had been prophesied several hundred years before in the Old Testament he would enter Jerusalem on a small donkey. Zechariah, the ninth chapter, the ninth verse, says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto you. He is just and having salvation. Isn't that wonderful? They knew he was bringing salvation even 400 years before Jesus came, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon the colt, the foal of an ass, you see, in times of war, a conqueror comes riding on the big horse, telling you, I'm going to take your city and your town. But in times of peace, the king would ride a colt, symbolizing that peace prevailed. And the peace that Jesus would bring, oh, what a great thing that was for us in our world. He's a king, and he's going to bring God's peace to a sinful world. Of course, this is not what they expected. Their tradition for years and years and years had been that a mighty warrior would come and free them from whatever slaves they were enslaved in, and at this time from the dreadful Romans. They expected a warrior king to free them from the dreadful Romans. Now we must remember that Jesus is coming again, this time as a mighty warrior against the evils of this world. No longer will be riding on a colt but he'll be riding on the big white horse coming to take the sins away. Just as Jesus depends on the day, on us today, so he did on mankind in that day. And if any man asks you, why do you lose him? Thus shall you say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. And they went and were sent and went their way and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, all of their offset unto them, why lose you the colt? And they said, The Lord had need of him. Well, let me ask you, whose donkey was it anyway? God's. It's God's donkey. What do we have that the Lord wants to use? Our hearts, our voice, our hands, our feet, our money. Are we as willing as the owner of the donkey to give up this time and energy and money to freely give to the Master? Whose hearts are we? Whose voice, whose hands, whose money is it anyway? What can we do to prepare the way of the Lord? We can live the Christian life and bring Christianity out into the open. Take it beyond the church, the people you see. Tell them you're a Christian, that Jesus Christ is our Savior. And quote to them John 14, 6, which says, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except by me. Don't let them get away with, I'm a good person. As we learned in Sunday school, some people thought they were a good person. But don't cut it. It's not what God wants us to do. We've got to bring Jesus and Christianity out into open into our activities. 
And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. This colt had never been rode. But guess what? He's going to be gentle in the hands of the Master. Oh, how great it would be if we could have the Master's hand upon us as did that humble donkey. They joined in by putting their coats on the donkey for Jesus to ride on. What have we got that goes unused that God might want to use? Would we be shocked to know that God can use some things in our life that we've never even thought about? We can say all the right things in our praise, but it must be backed up by faith in God and faith in God's Word. Now the multitude is going to get excited. They praise God from the heart. One of the dangers with the merciful, worshipful only is all, you know, they get all excited and called up. And uh, I heard one person, farmer, went to one of these modern churches and said, well, what's the difference? He said, well, the praise songs are different. He says, uh, you know, if I say to you, Martha, the cow is in the barn, they would say, Martha, 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 old Martha, the cow, the brown cow, the black cow, the purple cow's in the barn, 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 he's in the barn. And they do that three times. So that's the way a lot of this emotional stuff is. It gets you all fired up, but you got to get you fired up on the basis of the Word of God. Well, knowing the horror that awaited him, Jesus begins his faithful journey to the cross. And as they went to spread their clothes in the way, and he was come nigh, even now to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. He had stilled the storm. He fed the 5,000. He fed the 4,000. He walked on the water. He had two huge catches of fish. He turned water into wine. He healed people. He cleansed people. He raised people, including Lazarus. We can get caught up in emotional praise, not based on the scriptures, but they felt the joy because they had this powerful person leading them. That's why they, they got all the power and the joy from him. He was on their side. His power is what they've been looking for for years. And they were singing Hosanna in the highest, which is saved now, but they want to be saved from the Romans and not from the sins. They were actually inspired by God to deliver praise and this praise. And even the people in the crowd were able to feel the power of God in their lives where the, the Pharisees could not. Saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in high heaven and glory in the highs. They were saying the blessings inspired by God. This is some place they could got it from. God had filled their heart. And just as multitudes praised His birth, the angels praise from birth. So would God give them the praise now. They had no idea what they were saying. They were just excited that this mighty warrior king was coming. Because in a little while, their emotions would shift. And they would cry, crucify him. That, as we might, that is why we must be careful not to listen to our emotions or give lip service to God. Emotions are okay. But they've got to be backed up by the Word. They've got to have the power coming from Jesus Christ. When Jesus gives peace in our life, we must give God the glory. Praise Him in good times and bad times. Take God's peace, and we'll find a relief from this world's stress. We have been warned that this time on earth is short and full of woe, but it's not the end of things, just as my sister's Life is over here. It's not the end. It's beginning of a great life in heaven. I often wonder how the Pharisees, with their intense daily study, could not see the prophecies that they should have seen and how they miss the greatest blessing on earth, Jesus Christ. Well, we see that they did. And even to this day, we find millions of scholars are doing the same thing. It's not unusual. The more educated they are, the more apt to be agnostic or atheist or whatever, thinking that their intelligence is what the world's about. The Pharisees have been around Jesus for three years, hearing Him speak, hearing Him tell of the Word. And yet they would not humble themselves because they thought they were the superior people. And this is what 
Pride does. Pride goes before a fall. So there in their last times is going to be a great fall. Well, when we see the rock, what scripture should come into our mind? The rocks will cry out. What? The rocks will cry out. The rocks will cry out. So you out there looking at rocks? Remember, Jesus said, if you don't praise me, the rocks will cry out. And he says that in the 39th verse. And some of the Pharisees from the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you, that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. So when we see the stones, we need to be a reminder to cry out. And when I was growing up, we had a field that had two million stones on it. But I didn't know the scripture at the time. <laughs> it would have been a good one to remember. When I see the stones, he wants us to praise him. They instructed Jesus to keep all these people quiet because they wanted the praise of the people. Let us not seek praise, but give our praise to the Lord. Here the secret of the kingdom was made known. He advised different ones to keep it a secret. But now he was writing in telling them, The kingdom of God is now into you. That he is king of kings and lord of lords. Let us continue to praise the Lord. So when we see the rocks, we know they won't have to cry out. And we know at his crucifixion how the earth was dark and tremors. And the veil ran in two. As he continued on, he looked down the mountain, sadly knowing the choices they would make. The temple glistened with God's glory, but not their hearts. Jesus wept. And when he was come near, the, near, he beheld the city and wept over it. This was the second time that Jesus wept. He wept at the funeral of Lazarus, not so much for Lazarus, but for their misunderstanding of all the people. He looked at the city of Jerusalem. He saw the mixture of faces and the masses of humanity crowding there. He realized the emptiness of their lives and hearts. They had not heard the message of peace. They did not understand the purpose of His coming. His joy turned to sadness, knowing that so many would not believe on Him or ever have that full and abundant life <coughs> that He gives. Rejecting Jesus removes all the blessings that Jesus gives. In Psalms it tells us, don't forget all the benefits of loving Jesus Christ. Saying, if thou hast known even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they're hid from thine eyes. Praise the Lord, we've heard the joyful sound. Jesus saved, Jesus saved. We are here today because we know Jesus Christ. What a wonderful thing it is for our lives. And it's never too late while we're alive to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. The peace that Jesus gives, not as the world gives, enables us to be content where we are. That's one of the greatest blessings on earth, is to be content. So many people are looking for bigger houses, bigger land, bigger this, more of this, more of that, when all they really need is Jesus Christ in their hearts and lives. Here's the perfect example that I see, but cannot see. Ears hear, they cannot hear. There is no understanding in what they see and hear. Watch and wait. Be ready. He's coming again. For the day shall come upon them that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and come past thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of visitation. That sounds pretty terrible. I was talking to Robert Rampey on the phone and talking to him and uh, I was telling him, talking to him Somehow or I said, well, I got an excuse. And uh, he said, you got to read the fine print in the Bible. He <laughs> says, there are no excuses. And I said, yeah, but this is a great big one. <laughs> so, but he said, they're no, a they're very terrible time. There are no excuses. There are no excuses for them. We know if he's coming, we should be ready. Ready if not, we should meet a fate worse than death. Let's remember how much he wants to hold us in his arms and provide the love and comfort that he can give so call on him for comfort and rest. You know, Matthew 11, 28 says, Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Jesus taught the Word. He changed things around in the church. 
He told them the important thing was the Word. What is the church supposed to do and be? It's on our bulletin at the bottom. You can read it and follow it. And he went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought, saying unto them, It is written, My house is the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. How quickly a devout place of worship can lose its ways by doing things that seem so Christian, yet taken away from the teaching of the Word. Isaiah tells us that God is tired of outward show of Christianity without an inward love. You can do all these things in religion, when all God wants is a loving, caring heart. Let us not fall into the same trap. We must teach the Word. Jesus gives us the main use of the church in the 47th verse. And He taught daily in the temple. But the chief priests and the scribes and the chief of the people sought to destroy Him because He was teaching the Word. As they do over in the Muslim countries, when they hear the Word of God, they want to kill Him and could not find what they might do. They just couldn't do anything. Because they're paralyzed by God, for all the people who are attentive to hear Him. We cannot change other churches, but one thing is certain, we can be sure that our church teaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. He expects us to come and worship. Many churches like country clubs, gymnasium, and forget that the word that we're standing on holy ground. God calls us to a special time of worship, realizing He wants to be a part of our future. It is important that we listen for the message that God is delivering to us. Just as happy faces line the way to see Jesus, we will have those happy faces someday when He comes again. Forevermore, Palm Sunday reminds us that we too should greet each day with praises and singing with the anticipation that is to come. Little did they understand He would rise again. He will truly hold us in the arms that He's wanted to do so long ago. What is going to motivate us for the future? What is going to make us happy? Jesus' interest was as Zachariah predicted 400 years earlier. Remember, not only this time, but always Jesus was guided by the Word of God. Jesus prayed for guidance, comfort, and strength. The multitude emotionally praised God. They got stirred up, but not from the heart. Let us praise for bringing His Son and forget not all His benefits. As the steeples of the city glistened in His view, Jesus wept. Jesus taught the Word, eliminated many practices in the church. <coughs> Number one on our list is teach the Scriptures, because the Word is powerful. It changes lives. In Luke 19, we illustrate the tragedy of the Israelites, not recognizing their Savior Jesus, that they want, would soon reap much sorrow because they failed to understand what Jesus wanted to bring into their lives. And as we look at an example of bad choices made by the Israelites in rejecting Him and His Word, let's pray for God's wisdom, which He said He would pour out on us liberally to not repeat the same mistakes.